In this lesson, we're going to begin our coverage of the merger model, which is one of the more advanced topics in this course, but something that could easily come up in the context of investment banking and even private equity interviews. Now, previously, we've looked at Apple and completed a case study here showing what Apple's three financial statements look like. We went through and looked at their equity value, enterprise value, and then their valuation multiples. And then we actually completed a full valuation of Apple, creating this chart showing their valuation at different ranges and using different methodologies. We went through and did public company comparables, M&A transactions, and a DCF analysis. Up to this point, we've pretty much looked at Apple in isolation. What we're going to do now is instead of just looking at Apple by itself and modeling them and creating their statements and valuing them and figuring out how much they're worth, we're actually going to look at them in conjunction with another company, which is Research in Motion, also known as RIM. If you're unfamiliar with it, RIM, they are the maker of the BlackBerry device. So essentially in this merger model, we're going to be looking at Apple, the maker of the iPhone, iPod, iPad, laptops, etc., buying the maker of the BlackBerry device. So somewhat of an implausible situation because a merger like this would probably not happen in real life because it's too big and deals this size, $40, $50 billion, do not come around very often, but still something good to look at because these two companies are competitors in many markets. And so this is a good example of a merger or an acquisition with one competitor buying the other competitor. Now, the basic idea behind a merger model, the analogy that I like to use to explain this is to actually extend a concept that we went through before. When we looked at the concept of buying a house, and use that to explain equity value and enterprise value. So with that analogy, we said how equity value is sort of like a list price when you're going to buy a house and how enterprise value is how much it's actually gonna cost you once you take into account cash, debt, preferred stock, and so on. So how much the actual price of the house or the company is worth. Now, if we extend that analogy and we now Instead of just talking about the price of the house, we now go into the actual process of buying the house and what happens afterward. That takes us to an understanding of the merger model. So when you go to buy a house, there are basically three ways to do it. You can make a down payment. So you can put down some of your own cash and put that aside to and use that to buy the house. So maybe you have twenty or thirty thousand dollars saved up and you decide to use that as your down payment. But that's really not enough to buy a house, at least in the US. You're going to need probably at least a couple hundred thousand or even a million or more. So you're not going to have enough just with cash, your own cash to buy the house. So you're going to have to take on debt. Now with houses, as you know, this is called a mortgage. And so this allows you to buy a house that you would normally not be able to because you're taking on debt to buy it. You're putting down some of your own money in cash, but you're also taking on debt from the bank and you're using that to finance the purchase of your house. But then there's actually a third way that you could raise enough money to buy a house, which is to sell your existing house. Now, in reality, when most people go out and buy a house, they use a combination of all of these methods. Hardly anyone actually goes and buys a house purely with cash. They're going to have to take on some type of debt usually, and at least for normal people, citizens buying a house, normally they're going to sell their existing house before they go and buy a new one. So you have these three different methods of buying a house. And if you think about it, each of them is going to have a different impact on you afterward. So if you put down money for your down payment, then that means that you're not going to earn as much interest or investment income because you have less cash to invest. If you get a mortgage, that means that you're now going to have to pay interest on debt. So you now have this added interest expense. And if you sell your existing house, the effects there are a bit harder to quantify and to assess, but essentially when you sell your house, you're giving up value. And the tricky part here is that when you sell a house that you already own, you don't know what its true value really is. Its true value fluctuates depending on the market and other factors. So when you go to sell it, you might actually be taking a loss because you might have bought it at a higher amount. You might also have a gain on the investment, but it's risky and you don't know how it's going to change. You don't know what the value of it is going to be afterward. So these are the three different ways you can buy a house. Now, when you're going to buy a company, it's pretty much the same. You can use cash, debt, and stock. And these three different methods correspond to these three different methods of buying a house, a down payment, a mortgage, and selling your existing house. So when you use cash to buy a company, it's just like what we have here. Think of it as a down payment on a company. 
you're taking some of the cash that you have on hand and putting that toward the purchase of this new company. With a mortgage, of course, it's exactly like debt because when we take on debt from a bank to buy a company, we have to pay interest on it. We have to eventually repay the principal of the loan, very similar to mortgages. I'll add in repay principal here. So very similar to how a house mortgage works, when we take on debt to buy a company, we have to repay the principal and we owe interest expense on it. And then when we sell our house, well, that's just like issuing stock. Because when we issue stock from our company, we're giving up value. We're giving up ownership and transferring that ownership to another party. And similar to when we go to sell our house, if we're issuing stock to finance the purchase of a company, we might not be getting a good deal because if our company's value has fluctuated a lot or has changed a lot in some way, we don't really know if we're getting a good deal. We could be issuing stock at a much higher share price if we wait a little bit, or it could go much lower and it's risky and the value shifts around all the time. So in a merger model, what you're doing is you're looking at the impact of these three different methods, cash, debt, and stock. And you're looking at the profiles of the buyer and seller, and you're seeing what the impact is depending on how you actually buy the company and what the company looks like. So you're looking at the trade-off between three methods of purchase. Is it better to pay in all cash, in all debt, in all stock, or some combination of those? And that's really all a merger model is telling you. It's telling you after the fact, financially, how much better off are you or how much worse off are you depending on how you've actually paid for this company and what it looks like. Now, to support this model, you see that I've already sketched a basic outline of some of our transaction assumptions right here. And if you understand the analogy that I use to explain this, how buying a company like this with cash, debt, or stock is very similar to using a down payment, a mortgage, and selling your existing house when buying another house. If you understand that, then most of this is probably fairly intuitive. Percent cash, percent debt, percent stock. Also to support this new model, we're gonna have to have some new areas below the second area right here is something we're going to skip and come back to later on. Right below that, we have the financial profiles of the buyer and seller here. So Apple and Research in Motion, RIM. These are useful for us because it allows us to see at a glance roughly how big they are, what kind of taxes they're paying, what the, both companies' current share prices are. And then below that, we get into some of the financial analysis that will be required in this merger model. We also see on this other sheet, what I've done here is I've calculated in research in motions, equity value and enterprise value, very similar, almost exactly the same as what we did for Apple. I'm not gonna go through this again because I'm assuming here that you understand this concept. If you're curious to see where I got these numbers from and how I filled out everything here, I have linked to research in motion 6K here, which is their most recent report as of the time that we're assuming this transaction takes place. Now, if you go in here and you go down to their balance sheets, and you go down and look at their options tables and everything else like that, you can find all the information that I'm using right here. The other thing I've done here is I've just entered the balance sheet information for both Apple and RIM, buyer and seller right here. I've done this because later on in this merger model, we're gonna be looking at both companies' balance sheets and we're going to actually try combining them. And we'll look at some of the challenges that that presents. So I've copied in their balance sheets here. And again, all this information is just flowing directly from RIM's 6K. The reason it's called a 6K here, as opposed to a 10K or a 10Q, is because Research in Motion is a foreign company. It's based in Canada, as you can see right here. And so the terminology is a little bit different, but the concept is exactly the same. And everything in here is actually in US dollars because most of their customers, almost all of their revenue is coming from the US. So that's some of the setup here that is gonna be necessary for a merger model. With all that in place, you should have a better idea now of what a merger model actually means some of the key assumptions that we're gonna to use to set it up and the real world analogy that you can think of when you're analyzing a company like this, that when you buy a house, there's a down payment, cash, mortgage, debt, and selling your house, issuing stock. Those are the three ways to buy a house. We're going to apply it to a company here and look at the trade-offs between these three different methodologies. So coming up in the next video, we're gonna be getting into the next part of this, which is the transaction assumptions right up here. And we'll be entering in numbers for these and you'll see how some of the numbers flow throughout our model and how we're gonna make some of the calculations that will be necessary to look at the impact of each of these purchase methods. So figuring out how much in interest income we're giving up, how much in additional interest expense we're paying and how much value we're losing by issuing stock should we decide to do that to buy this company.